What's up, everyone, man? Welcome back to D Talk TV. Uh, it's your guy again, Diego Brown, coming to you guys again today. I want to say thank you guys so much for all the support that you guys have been giving. Um, the last video um, and the last uh, recording, they don't know enough to know. It's been getting really, really great reviews. And I just, like I told you guys last time, this is just the beginning. So I want to say thank you guys so much for tuning in and participating. Uh, once again, guys, to subscribe to us, just to listen to the show, you can go to anchor.fm forward slash detalk TV. If you want to actually watch uh, the uh, actual podcast, the actual video, you can always go to uh, the YouTube channel at detalk TV. We are on so many different platforms right now. Uh, the podcast has just been picked up, but I'm going to say it's like seven other uh, platforms. We got Breaker, uh, Google Podcast, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and of course Spotify. Now we're still pending on uh, Castbox and Apple, but it is coming as well. Uh, if you guys have any questions, concerns, you just want to check, you can always hit us up at detalk2019 at gmail.com. Also, if you want to be on the podcast, you have any questions, you can actually go to anchor.fm.com, leave your questions, we will put you on the podcast. So, today's show, uh, we're actually going to be talking about the residue of slavery. Uh, and so, uh, when it comes to the psychology, so we're going to actually, the psychology of the residue of slavery, right? And uh, me, myself, I am really well versed on a lot of different topics, but I had to go get an expert, right? So I would say, man, like, who do I know? And uh, I have one of the uh, great uh, mentors, the the great friends of mine, man, somebody who has boots on the ground, who has been in the community working, trying to spearhead this for years. Uh, man, so I have a doctor of psychology and studied kinesiology theology uh he's a public speaker like i said boots on the ground has been in the community fighting against systemic oppression uh trying to educate the black community for years now has uh published if i'm not mistaken over 20 books 20 literary uh documents so you guys can go out and read now it was two in particular books that made me i said i need to call my my friend um it's two of his actually books uh the psychopath the psychopathology as a legacy of slavery and born into captivity uh these documents these books you understand this is what i'm talking about these particular books is actually going to talk about exactly what we're going to dive deep in today i want you guys to you know show some love and respect and honor to my friend my my good big brother dr rick wallace man dr wallace how you doing today sir I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me on. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Wallace, once again, man, like I said, I had to every, let everybody know your um, your credentials because this is something that you have been doing for years now, right? Uh, as uh, and Can you tell everybody a little bit about what you have done, uh, what you've been doing in the community, and some of your, your, your books that you have out right now? Okay. Uh, yes, I've been boots on the ground in the community for a couple of, a little over two decades, hardcore. Uh, I launched, uh, what you've been in the music industry, you kind of know what I'm talking about. I literally took an entertainment company that I had that was focused in the music industry and in modeling and literally transitioned it from Odyssey Entertainment into the Odyssey Project, which is focused on empowerment in the black community because just donating money at the time wasn't enough for me. So I decided right. to take my knowledge of psychology and sociology and engage the problems with the purpose of not only discovering 
uh, the core elements of the problems, but also providing a solution. And so I've been doing that. Uh, we have Black Men Lead, which we'll talk about. Black Men Lead is a rite of passage program that I designed and created some years ago uh, that's designed to uh, create a rite of passage that helps to socialize uh, young black males into manhood based off of the unique and specific challenges that they face uh, in this culture and in this society. And socialization is a major core element of creating individuals who can be productive and functional and actually walk in the roles that they were designed to walk in. One of the biggest contributors to black male violence is the lack of proper racial socialization. Right. And so after discovering that, and I actually, believe it or not, everybody knows Dr. Joy DeGroote for her work on post-traumatic slave syndrome, which I've also done work on multi-generational trauma uh, from my book, Born in, pa uh, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as the Legacy of Slavery. Uh, I touch it, I touch on it on a couple of elements, but I also visit it, visit on it from a genetic perspective and epigenetics. And so, uh, but I learned a lot from Dr. DeGroo in the area of black, uh, black male violence, and especially in the area of adolescent and young adult male violence, gotcha. black male violence. And so I took that from her, uh, uh, another uh, unbelievable black mind, Dr. Howard Stevenson out of the University of uh, Pennsylvania and I took it and I stretched it and I went deeper and I looked for things and I, I stood on their shoulders and I, I, I came up with what I needed and there are five core elements and then I'll turn it back over. Five core elements that influence uh, whether a black male is going to be uh, a risk of committing violence and it helps you predict the risk of violence in any black male if you understand these elements and there are three core elements that are going to be present in almost any situation where there's a high risk for black male violence. Okay, uh, well, but Dr. Wallace, hold on. I'm, I'm going to actually cut you off right there because what we're going to do, let's, we're going to dive into that because I wanted to kind of transition into that. So let's okay. start let's start right there. So uh, the first thing that I think that we've talked about before is uh, the weapons of slavery, the psychological effects that still exist today. So I just okay. wanted to pose that question so you can actually dive deep into that. So yeah, the psychological effects that still exist today from actually slavery and uh yeah talk about that and with especially when it comes to black men okay with in order to enslave a people the initial element is going to be forced right you, you you take them you kidnap them you put them in a foreign or alien environment uh you use threats of violence to control them but eventually if you want slaves who are going to be productive and fluent You've got to trust that they are not going to run. They're not going to rebel. Correct. And so then, then there are other elements. And one of the core components, uh, and they all kind of run together, some of the topics that you told me you wanted to cover today. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's psychological warfare in convincing them, or robbing them, basically robbing them of their identity. If Correct. If you want to enslave a person, you have to first rob them of their identity. You have to take away the core elements of self. So that's going to be their relationship with God, their right. relationship with themselves, right. their relationship with their history. Mm -hmm. You want to rob them of their values, their interests, and their principles. And then you want to reinstill your values, your interests, and your principles. And you want them to always come in to this equation as an inferior element. In other words, when you present them in this new element that you created for them, they are never the power brokers. They are never the winners, they're always the losers, they're always dependent, they're always dumber, they're all, I mean, just every element of society as it exists. Right. Uh, and so that, that, that's the psych psychological element. Right. And then through that, you have, you start to uh, teach uh, intellectual inferiority, physical inferiority, social inferiority, and, and on down the line. And what you create in that is a dysfunctional perception of self and self-concept or self-identity or self-image, however you want to refer to it. With the self-concept, that's how you relate to the world. That's how you see yourself. Correct, you correct. You see yourself as inferior. Right. Then you begin to behave as inferior. In other words, uh, I came up with a concept that I use in actually working with clients to help them improve with, uh, in one of my companies called Visionetics. And Visionetics is simply understanding how you view yourself in the world and how you use that view of yourself to create the world around you that you desire. You cannot see it 
In other words, if you grow up in an environment where your parents are always telling you that you're never going to amount to anything, that mm-hmm. you're not going to do anything, uh, you're going to be just like your daddy, whatever the situation is. Right. And you hear it enough and you believe it. You will never outperform it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I want to chime in even on that because, you know, our brother Michael, right, we just had this recent conversation and we were talking about, um, you know, that as a people, we had to stop killing each other. We have to stop warming each other. And I brought up that just point. I was like, well... When you take people from their land, you strip them from any identity, right? So as you were talking about that you have other cultures who can actually trace their lineage, right? They can go to Asia, you go to uh, Latin America. They know where they come from, they have self-pride. So if you strip them of their, uh, of their foundation, their lineage, they don't have any pride. We even look at our black women when they want to actually go and put certain different hairs in their head, uh, in, in the head or makeup or whatever the case may be to try to look like something that doesn't look like our people. And like you said, then there is a false sense that's given by the media. You should look like this. You should act like this because you're not up here. Then you end up creating this false sense of reality. That breeds self-hatred. Absolutely. Uh, and that's where the you, you, you and Michael were talking about killing one another, well, uh, that's a result of self-hatred in and of itself. Number one is uh, when you look at something, I, I call it the Eurocentric idea. Correct. The Eurocentric idea is when white people determine uh, what's classy, what's beautiful, <laughs> what's successful. Right. Uh, every, everything is identified through the lens of Eurocentricity. And when you have a situation where that's the case, and you are defined by a Eurocentric idea, but you are Afrocentric in nature. Right, then right. Then you're going to always feel inferior. You, you can walk into a Eurocentric environment, but you must walk in as a person with an Afrocentric idea. Correct, uh, correct. Identity. And so that's the thing you have to look at, and that was the problem. Uh, slaves were stripped of that. That's why their names were changed. Uh, that's why their, their their relationship with God, their spirituality was mm-hmm. challenged, uh, and so many other things. And I don't want to get off into that because I know that's something you want to talk about coming up. Right. But all of these elements play into this psychological reality. And then there is a, a genetic element in this called epigenetics that also works to uh, create uh, pre uh, dispositions for a lot of different things: the upregulation of certain genes, the downregulation of certain genes through experience. Right. And then that can also be passed on uh, through procreation. So mm-hmm. not only can your genes be altered by what you experience, and we learn that now that there's this thing called ACEs, right? Right. ACEs correct. Are ad- adverse childhood experiences, mm-hmm. and what we know now is that as each each adverse childhood experience that you experience as a child. It's, called, it's worth a point. When you get to just four points, it starts impacting your health for your life. Wow. Uh, adverse, child, uh, adverse childhood experiences, parents breaking up, mm-hmm. child abuse, domestic abuse, extreme poverty, sexual abuse, all these different things that create a negative psychological experience. It's called an adverse childhood experience. If you get four of them, you are 12 times as likely to commit uh, to attempt suicide in your life. Wow. You are four times more likely to develop uh, coronary heart disease, four times more likely to to develop diabetes. Mm. Things that you would never ever associate with personal experiences are actually impacted and precipitated to a certain extent by those experiences. So imagine going back to a time when in state slavery where there were these traumatic experiences Mm. that, but there was never any treatment. Correct, right. The centuries of violence hostility, being ripped away from your home, your identity stripped from you, mm-hmm. feeling, and tr- being feel- feeling and being treated as if you were less than human. Right. And, and then when it's all said and done and your progeny generations later are released, they're just released into the world and told, told to figure it out. Right. No treatment, no right. setup for success. Uh, even the things that were promised, like 40 acres and a mule, mule mm-hmm. was then turned around and snatched away. Correct. But yet they were consistently told to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, but they didn't have boots. And then so and and what you're saying is for the audience who is listening that from our ancestors and our Uh gene pool, they have passed on trauma from generation to generation. So everything as far as our physical, our well-being, mental being, all these particular things 
have been actually passed on through is because now it's in the gene pool. Right. What you have is a multiple, a multi-element function that facilitates the perpetuation of multi-generational trauma. Wow. Epigenetic is just one. Right. You have social learning theory, which says if I'm exposed to a certain behavior, it's going to have an impact on how I develop. Correct. Social learning theory is how we learn so much of what we are, the modeling of behavior by those before us. So if you've got people who are dysfunctional, they're, moder- they're modeling dysfunctionality to their progeny. Their progeny will pick up behaviors they don't even understand before they understand them. You will find people who had, say for instance, you've got a mother who was in a car accident uh, before her children were born. Right. She was in a car accident, and she was in this accident because she was sitting at a light. A car came through the light, lost control, and hit her, and it was very traumatic. She lived, but it it, it, it makes her real anxious. Right, correct. She sits at light. So now she has these kids, and these kids ride with her all the time. But they notice that when mom gets to a light, she gets real anxious. They will develop that same anxious, or that same anxiety for sitting at a red light and not even know why. Wow. Okay, so that's the social learning theory part of it. Mm-hmm. That's also the that's also a leaning into the epigenetics. Epigenetics epi stands for above. Uh, so it means above the gene. So it means that gene expression can be controlled without the DNA sequence being altered. And all that means is prime example. I actually spoke internationally on this as far as cancer is concerned. Right. Okay, you have multiple cancer genes, but in order to get most cancers you have to have at least four, 12 to 14 cancer genes turned on simultaneously in order to trigger a certain form of cancer. Wow. And which one of those genes are turned on will determine what kind of cancer starts. Okay. And that starts the cancer mutation. All right. What happens is in this is you go through influences mm-hmm. that will trigger or upregulate a gene. So say, for instance, you're in an a, a, a abusive relationship. Okay. That's triggering negative genes to be upregulated. And then you can go to someone else who, say, meditates a lot. Right. It has total control over their mental thoughts, how they perceive things. Mm-hmm. They never, their heart rate never goes up because they never get upset about anything because they're controlling their mental capacity for a positive. Gotcha. One is highly more likely to develop cancer and a number of other diseases than the one who can control their mind. So now you're understanding that there's an element of the mind that makes you more susceptible to health, but also more susceptible to healing. Gotcha. And you know, I want to actually stop right there because for, for the audience, I want you guys to really, really actually soak that in. So Dr. Wallace, once again, has explained from our traumas, day-to-day traumas, whether it's uh, the the social, the economic uh, oppression, all these different things that we're going on, we see even in media. These things right. are triggering our bodies, right. these different sicknesses. So you wonder why your grandma and big mama, and they say they call it the sugar, or we got high blood pressure and hypertension. All these right. things have been, we are creating this based on what we're seeing and experiencing. Now, and I also, I want to kind of segue into something else because, uh, this is something that I know that is also a part of it, right? So uh, we talk, you hint on religion, and I, I know this is also a gray area, and i kind of been battling with this because I am in church. I know that you are... Uh, you study theology and you have your degree in it and you actually uh, ran seminary as well. The weaponization of actual religion, how it was actually used to contain us, to keep us in, in slavery. Like I said, we're not even going to talk about what how Christianity was used even before that. Like when we talk about the Council of Nicaea, that, that's going to be for a different uh, show. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, we, yeah. we definitely got to dive into that, but we got to give people something else for that one. But can you talk, kind of talk a little bit about that, how actually religion was used to actually keep us in that containment as well? Right. I mean, no matter where you go back in history, mm-hmm. you have to understand the dynamic of religion. Uh, people confuse relationships with God or connectivity with God with automatically being a religious experience, and that's not necessarily the case. Right, uh, right. Ancient Africa, for instance, had a strong connectivity to the divine, but did not practice religion. It wasn't a Correct. religious practice. It was Correct. a relational and a connective practice. And religion has always been an element of control. If you mm. look at it, it's always about what God doesn't want you to do. If you right. think about it, it's what God, God doesn't want you to do. If you look at, say, for instance, you go to the Decalogue, 
which is the tenth com the ten commandments, commandments correct, which correct. is just ten of hundreds of laws that God gave Israel through Moses. Okay, so everybody thinks the Ten Commandments is it. No, that's just the Decalogue that everybody focuses on, but there are 120 just on behavior alone. Then there are right. another hundred on feast festivals and all of this stuff, right? But if you go to that, if you look at the Decalogue, it says you shall not or thou shall not, mm -hmm. right? But if you go back 5,000 years prior to that, and you look at the admonitions of my my eyes, then it's not thou shalt not. It's the declaration. It says I have not. I have not. It's absolutely. a higher. It's a higher spiritual awareness of what God designed you for. So you don't have to be told what not to do. You, you should already know that you haven't done it. Absolutely. So okay. So we move down and we see as. Uh, society or civilization starts to underturn, you start to see the need to control. And as kingdoms and empires are built, religion is always a mechanism of control. If you go back, and, and I love to do this with Christians because it's something they understand. Mm -hmm. All right, if you go back to the book of Daniel, and you look at the book of Daniel, you have the Hebrew children, including Daniel, but also including Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and, Abednego. and Abednego. Yes, sir. Right? The, when they tried to re-socialize them, how did they do it? They gave them a new religion, told them when they could pray, when they couldn't pray. Absolutely. And they gave them different food than they were allowed to eat. Created a whole and new structure for them. Right. Yes, sir. Right. So, so in other words, one of the fastest ways to re-socialize somebody is to shift their view of God and change it to your view, mm -hmm. and you automatically put them at a disadvantage. And if you, real, if you go back and you read that scripture again, the way that Daniel and the other three got through it was they did not partake of the delicacies. They didn't eat their food. They Absolutely. only ate vegetables. Right. And they continued their own prayer pattern. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. So that's how they end up being these unbelievably powerful forces in our minds as believers, right? So, but you have to understand the dynamic. And that's always been the case. If you go back and look, when the Persians first took Babylon, right, same it's, thing, absolutely they same thing. They introduced another situation. That's where you start coming in, and you look in the Book of Esther. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so it's all that to show you that this is nothing new. That religion has always been used to control. So then you go back to Constantine, and you talk about the Council of Nicaea, which we're not going to get into. <laughs> we, we can't but, get it there, man. But that's 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 like two. That's a series. Yeah, it but, is right, right. But, but, but what you have to understand is that's a part of uh, the Inquisitions and the Crusades. Correct. And you have to understand that the Inquisitions and the Crusades, that this particular thing started when Constantine, who was a Roman emperor, was converted to Christianity and decided that Christianity would become the universal uh, religion. religion right. And it would be easier to control this expanding empire. Because as you consume other lands and territories, you also consume their religion. Correct. So when you got all these different territories that extend outside of your normal borders, like for instance, the U.S. has the Virgin Islands and uh, British also has Puerto Rico. Great Britain, yeah, right. Right. So it's it's difficult to control things there because you got to send somebody to these territories. Uh, and try to get them to rule from there, but you got these people with differing beliefs. So if I can convert the whole land to Christianity, then I can tell them God said it. Right. That's the end of it. Absolutely. And, and that so is how you what, control the, the slaves. Like, because God told that, you, I'm going to give you this right. food, give you this slop once again. And that, that's something else I talked on the previous one is that when you strip people from their land and give them a particular sort of food, a particular sort of diet, and you give them everything that you want them to have, and then you say the higher power said you were supposed to do this. Right. And see, the introduction of God into the equation of slavery, along with the Bible that they used certain verses in to justify slavery. Absolutely. And Obey your slave the masters is for Jesus. And being white, not black, automatically creates an inferiority complex. Correct. Because this is your God. Here's, this is what your God looks like. Your God looks like me. Mm -hmm. But you look like you. So you are already at a disadvantage. You're lucky we're even letting you serve our God. I eat okay. the white Jesus hanging up in everybody's grandma's house. Yeah, we. <laughs> right, right. So, so let me tell you something. If you study religion, mm -hmm. if you go to Asia, mm -hmm. their God looks like them. Yep, absolutely. You go, you go to uh, places uh, 
in, in Central America, their God looks like them. You go to India, their God looks like them. Exactly like them, right. This is the only place where right. the God doesn't look like no, no, no. a certain percentage of the people that, have been, that the God has been given to. Correct. And, uh, and then a lot of people will make the argument, well, Christianity was in Africa long before it's transatlantic slavery, and it was. It was, right. But, see, it, it, but th there's a difference. And you also got to understand, even then, it was being forced through crusading Correct. and inquisition. People were being tortured and murdered into receiving it and accepting it. Absolutely. So, so you still, just because someone's practicing something doesn't mean it's still not foreign to them. Right, and, they, and they're willfully the accepting it, right. Right. The vast majority of Africa was colonized. Correct. By either Britain, France, mm -hmm. and so it then eventually America. Right. So you got to understand the dynamic. Again, we're talking psychology and sociology of how blacks have been socialized into their environment. They've been socialized through the lens of egocentricity. I mean, Eurocentricity. So it's a Caucasian European idea of what is. And Correct. so God is white. God is European. So you, as a matter of fact, you got a large number of blacks right now today. Just present a black Jesus, and you'll get them all in their field. <laughs> Absolutely. And, even and it's crazy part. Even when the Bible describes that it, he had our skin hue, right? Right. Because well, I, I, mean, I know my skin. Bible tells you, the Bible tells you. Now everybody who studied ancient Egypt knows that ancient Egyptians were black. Absolutely correct. So you tell me how a white Jesus. And his white mama and his white daddy <laughs> escaped to Egypt and hid among nothing but black people. Absolutely, right? You Come on there. Like it don't make no sense <laughs> in me at all. So, so I mean, it takes an understanding of history. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes an understanding of psychology, sociology. It takes an understanding of mental health. Uh, but what we're looking at is the result of the weaponization of religion in the sense of God basically giving people a God that they can't relate to. Right. And, and then showing them how that God wants them to serve, and then telling them that everything that they're going to get for their service will happen in the afterlife right. in heaven. Yeah. And so it <laughs> takes them away. And that's why you have so many people who take, black people who take on this mindset. Even Dr. King puts it mm -hmm. in his most famous speech. Absolutely. That unearned suffering is redemption. Right, absolutely. No, it's suffering, it's a suffering way. We always been taught right. that in religion, right. Right, that there's something uh, holy and glorious about suffering. And then, you got to understand that almost everybody that's converted to Christianity is converted through the introduction of the cross. Right. So, now check this out. So your first relationship with God is through suffering. Mm. Because Slavery. Christ suffered on the cross. Slavery. So, no, no. <laughs> I'm talking about your understanding your relationship with God. I'm not right. even talking about the slavery experience. I'm right. talking about even today. Right. When you try to convert somebody, you tell them Christ died for you. Right. So your first, your first relate, your first truth, your first experience with God is that somebody suffered. Right. Absolutely. And the reason why I was saying slavery is because that was the suffering way. And I'm, I'm right. trying to connect those dots because everything is really based off suffering, slavery, oppression. Right, right, All those right. are connecting dots. Right. And the diversion of what, what should be expected. Okay. Everybody else and their God are having this relationship where they're experiencing the benevolence of their God in the, in, in the current life. But blacks were given an idea of heaven, something far away, mm. uh, and, and that isn't even biblical. If you actually sit down and you study it, right. it isn't biblical, because if you, if you study, the whole purpose of Christ was revolution. Right, absolutely. It was a, it was a revolutionary idea. But in, when, 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 when Christ is teaching the disciples how to pray, he unveils what was unveiled initially in Genesis. Correct. He says, when you pray, you should pray, our Father who art in heaven. Right. Hallowed be thy name. In other words, your name is holy. Thy kingdom what? Come. Come. Yeah. Uh -uh. So let's look at this. Your kingdom come. That means that your kingdom in heaven comes to earth. Thy will be, be done. done. Where? On well, earth. As, as it what? is in heaven. <laughs> as in other words. As Christ came to earth to colonize earth with the culture of heaven. Absolutely. So we are supposed to be experiencing heaven on, on earth. earth. Okay. Right. 
And so if you go to any country that's been colonized, if you go to the Bahamas, they were colonized by Britain. They, uh, the J Jamaica was colonized by Britain. Mm -hmm. They drive on the other side of the road than what we're used to. Mm -hmm. We were, we were uh, initially a British colony, but we bucked. Correct. And so we Revolution. were on the wrong side of the road as a part of the rebellion. So, but if you go there, in, in Jamaica right now, you wouldn't believe it, but if you go there, they still have high, they still have tea at high noon. Right, they, they do, absolutely, and I know so. Oh, and that comes from <laughs> Absolutely. And Dr. Wallace, look, I, you know what? We could go on and on about this. We almost at the done of this particular podcast, and I just want to hit on one more thing, and then we, I know I got to get you to come back because we got to still dive deep into it. So like I said, we got a probably a six or seven part series, but the one right. last thing I want to talk about hitting on right now is um the intentional demasculation of the black Ooh. man and so and and this is also this is a rabbit hole but if i can get you to speak on that briefly because as you talked about the weaponization of slavery the weaponizing of, of religion and how this was used as one of the major weapons because the demasculation of black men is the reason why we have so many it, emotionally unintelligent and how they are afraid of us in this particular moment and element so if you could talk a little bit about that i appreciate it okay i, I i'll be as brief as i brief as i can and uh -huh. then maybe, maybe maybe we'll get a chance for me to come back and we'll talk specifically about that yes sir okay what you got to understand is you got two elements within the black community mm -hmm. the black community has black women they are feminine by nature black Correct. men are masculine by nature i'm not talking about any type of uh, superficial, I'm talking about energy, spiritual energy, and natural uh, existence. And what you have when you merge the two is synergy, the merging of feminine energy with masculine energy, creating a sinking of energy we call synergy that allows us to do things as units that we can't do as individuals. Now, women are naturally spiritual. They even have a spiritual womb. Mm -hmm. you want, it, 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 and it's powerful. Because when you a, a black man can give a black woman his vision, she literally puts it in her spiritual womb, and then she carries it, and she births it. It's a part of the process that cannot happen without. So that, that's the power of the black woman. She elevates. And I often say that we can only get as high as our women elevate us. Absolutely. Listen, Absolutely. Here's the problem. We will never move an inch, no matter how high we get, if the black man isn't leading. Correct. If he isn't moving us forward, because he physically has the force and the power to move us forward. So what happens is we take away the protection because, see, without the black man's protection, the black woman's, the black woman's spirituality begins to wane. Absolutely. Because now she's got to fend for herself. Right. Now she's got to look out for herself. Now she's got to play both roles. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about demasculation, we also must pay attention to emasculation. Right. Demasculation is the presentation of non-masculine qualities that appear to be feminine. Emasculation is taking away the power and the force of the masculinity of a black man. In other words, showing that the black man doesn't have power. Right. And that's one of the He's first inferior. things that happened on the plantation. I'm right. going to rape your wife in front of you. I'm going to show her you have no power to do anything about me. That everything she needs, she's got to get from me. Right. And then I'm going to rape you in front of you. In front right. of them. In front of your family. Right. And show how and weak so, you are. Wow. Right. Right. That takes away the power. That's the emasculation. Mm -hmm. Now what you're getting a lot of is demasculation. That is the presenting of black men in a feminine life. And they will do that all day long. Why? Because even black women who love gay men, black gay men, they, they, that's my friend. He's so funny. He's so cool. They love him to death. And, I, and, and don't get me wrong. I love all my brothers and sisters no matter what they identify with sexually. But we're talking about productivity. And, and, and then they move forward. And I'll say this and I'll turn it back over to you. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. While our women love them and have a ball with them, they're not going to follow them. They can't leave. Correct. So if I can demasculate you, emasculate you, I can sit up and actually let you be successful and you still will never stand up. If I'm an emasculate man, you're never going to see emasculated men, demasculated men, out fighting on the block to save the block. And that's, that's, that's extremely powerful. Well, Dr. Wallace... Once again, man, I appreciate you. We've covered so much in this past, what, 30, 30 minutes plus, um, and that's just the beginning of it. Uh, what we were experiencing right now in this world, right now, is a shift in energy. This is something that needed to happen, and I've said this earlier. I've said this in the past couple of weeks. What I do love about what has happened with 45 being the current leader of the United States, 
uh, with the uprising of uh, everyone to let the put the put the world on notice that we're we're not going to continue to go through this uh, oppression. It needed to happen. Like revolution had to happen. Eventually, it was going to happen. When we talk about the apartheid in Africa, it had to happen. So uh, we're going to dig more into these things. Uh, once again, Dr. Wallace, I appreciate you, your time, man. If you guys want to go and uh, follow Dr. Wallace, he's on all the social media. You can actually see him, uh, uh, Dr. Rick Wallace. Uh, he has so many different literary uh, books out there. We got Critical Mass, a Treat with the Unlimited Capacity to Be Phenomenal. Born in Captivity is a lot of what he touched on today. Uh, the Miseducation of Black, black Youth in America, uh, Special Education as the uh, mechanism for the miseducation of African youth. When I tell you this man has already been on the forefront to try to educate us and empower us, uh, it's been it's been a wonderful thing. <laughs> Once again, everyone, you guys can check us out on anchor.fm forward slash detalk TV. Uh, if you want to subscribe, uh, you can go to Anchor. Uh, we have three subscription packages. It's 99 cents, uh, $4.99, and $9.99. You can always subscribe. You can always check us out on all of our seven platforms that I uh, put in up earlier. Reach us at Detalk TV. 2019 at gmail.com also the brown collective that is the actual organization the company www the brown collective just like i spelled it right there just like i said it dot com please check us out once again thank you guys for uh tuning in to d talk tv we love you to next week see you later Rick Wallace here dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that I run like Myriad Business Solutions the Visionetics Institute Odyssey Media Group I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston Dallas and other areas uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.